Patrick Hurl. And I'm doing something right now that I do quite often. Just simply taking my dogs for a walk. Now I have two dogs. One's name is Hildegard, or we call her Hildy. She's quite an interesting mix of St. Bernard, German short-haired pointer, poodle, and boxer. At about 85, 90 pounds, she's a pretty big dog. And my second dog, his name is Bruno. And he's a mixture of German Shepherd and some sort of hunting hound. And these two dogs, they wake me up pretty early every morning and I take them for a walk. And several times throughout the day and into the evening, I take them out for a walk. Something just very natural that I just do. And so when Father Tollefson asked me to start a weekly series on talking about the truths of our faith, thinking about something that we need to live very naturally. And so, welcome to the first edition of Walking Our Dogma, as we explore over the next couple of weeks truths of our Catholic faith. And a couple of things to remember as we begin this journey. I'm going to talk a little bit more about each one of these, but the first one is, is the idea that if there is a truth, then we should be able to experience it. And so each time that we go through and talk about truths of our faith, I try to help people begin to understand how that impacts our life today. And then second, every truth we have revealed by God has some place, some purpose in his overall plan for the salvation of the world. And so as we go and we look at these two ideas, in the context of looking at various truths of our faith over the next couple of weeks. Just keep them in mind because they'll help you evaluate or to understand how to incorporate these truths of our faith into our everyday life, into things as simple and things that we do so naturally as walking our dog. As I mentioned earlier, Father Tollefson has asked me to create a series of videos talking about truths of our Catholic faith. When we talk about truth of our Catholic faith, really the place to go is the catechism. And so what we're going to do here over these videos is really take a walk through the catechism, kind of like walking our dogma, walking through the catechism and, and, and looking at and exploring the truths that are in there. This catechism actually was a project of St. John Paul II, here, picture behind me, and was published in 1993. It really was one of the things that John Paul felt was coming out of the spirit of Vatican II was the need to write another catechism. It's not. And so we're going to work our way through that. We'll talk about a little bit more of that at the end here about how we're going to how we're going to do that. But as I mentioned earlier, as we look at these truths, there's two things that we want to remember. First one, again, comes from St. John Paul II. Now, St. John Paul was many things. Uh, he was a uh, he was a theologian. Uh, he's you know he was a, a priest, a cardinal, ultimately the pope. He's also a playwright, but he was also a philosopher. And his philosophy, or that came that that he was exposed to and really drawn to, and ultimately it impacted a lot of his writing was a German philosophy called phenomenology, which is just a big fancy word for if there is truth that I can experience. And that's always really resonated with me, the idea that if there is a truth that God has revealed to us, there's a purpose why he's revealed it to us, and there it should impact my life today. Not just some good idea, 
I mean, this catechism here is not just filled with lots of good ideas. It's filled with truth. Truth revealed to us over time through the body of Christ and from Christ himself and from God so that we might know him, we might live in him, be his sons and daughters. So the truth in there all has a purpose and we can experience that. Something that impacts our life today so that we can walk with Jesus. A good friend of mine, I remember the first time we were sitting in a men's small group and I, had, I, met, I was talking about some truth. I can't remember exactly what it was, but he looked me right in the eye and he said, what does that look like? I kind of stepped back a second. And then I realized what he was asking. He said, you've told me a truth. What does it look like when that impacts your life? So I thought for a minute, and then I shared with him an experience of where that truth had made a difference in my life. And I've continued to think about that question. He continues to, to pose that question to me. And when I've worked with other people that are you know, are, are planning on giving a testimony or, or are going to give a talk, I continue to at, pose that question to them as well. What does it look like? Become a phenomenologist like St. John Paul II. And help people understand that the truths of our faith make a difference. They impact our life today in very real ways. Now, the second thing that I mentioned that we want to remember as we explore these truths in the Catechism is God's plan of salvation. We can't forget that these truths not only impact our life today, but they're part of God's plan. God's plan for the salvation of the world. And that, God, that plan, when it gets boiled down to its finest points, it's, it, it's just its essence has been called the kerygma. It's like the only Greek word that I really know. And we see that in Peter in the Acts of the Apostles. We see Paul present it uh, in the Acts of the Apostles and in, in places in his epistles. And I've always looked at, when you boil it down, what it really looks like is God, man, Jesus, you. So God. God created us in his image and likeness. There's a truth. What does that mean to me today? But he made us in his image and likeness. And if he is love, as John says in his letter, his first letter, then we are made to love as well. And God loves because he, is, he gives of himself and we can give of ourselves as well. God created us in his image and likeness. Man. But what did we do? We did not trust in him. What's original sin? Pride. Not trusting it, that God is truly a loving father. And so turning away from him, doubting in that, doubting in his love for us and in his perfect will and providence. And so sin enters the world and that relationship that God designed us to have with him is separated because of our choice. Because we're given free will to love, that's how God created us, and we choose not to. Our first parents did, and we know in our own lives we all sin, we all make those choices at times to turn away from love, to not be a gift of ourselves, to not love God with our whole heart, mind, and soul, and love our neighbor as we have been loved. Jesus. God, in his plan of salvation, desires us to be in union with him forever. And because of our sin, we can't pay the debt we owe. 
So God does the merciful and loving thing. He sends His only Son. God so loved the world that He sent His only Son to come into the world. God humbles Himself, becomes man, became like us in all things but sin, humbled Himself to take on our humanity. And He did that so that He could suffer and die on the cross to pay the debt because our debt for sin needed is the payment is blood. And only God himself can pay that debt. And so he does. God becomes man. The word becomes flesh, dwells among us, full of grace, and then suffers and dies on the cross to pay our debt for sin. So that in rising from the dead, he restores us to life, restores our relationship with the Father. That is what the Father had. That is his plan for salvation always. God created, man sinned. Jesus came so that he may show us the Father and restore our relationship to the Father through his passion, death, and resurrection. And then there's finally you and me. It is our choice. We have been given the gift of the Holy Spirit. We have been given the gift of free will. God has, has come and restored our ability to be in relationship with him. But we must choose to love. So that's our charisma. That's the plan of salvation in a nutshell. God, man, Jesus, you. And so as we go through and we begin to look at these truths in the catechism, let us remember that plan of salvation. And where does this truth fit in God, man, Jesus, you? What does it look like and where does it fit in God's plan? We're going to continue to ask those questions in each and every video because that makes the truth real to us because it is. Because God is present and wants us to grow in relationship with him. He wants to transform us and make us holy. He wants us to draw us closer to him. He wants us to grow every day in faith hope, and love. So I'd like to start into the Catechism by just looking at the first paragraph of several thousand paragraphs that are in the Catechism. The first one continues to speak to me because when I was considering and discerning whether the Lord was calling me to go into formation to become a deacon, one of the things that our archdiocese had put into place was that the prerequisite was going to be the catechetical institute. We were going to study the catechism. Now, at that point in my spiritual journey, I really hadn't read much of the catechism at all. I'd gone there a couple of times because I knew I could get questions answered, so I would go there. And I really saw the catechism as, as the, the Catholic encyclopedia. And so I remember very clearly heading for the first night of the Catechetical Institute. I had my new, brand new green catechism in hand. And I was expecting to start with A, you know, like Alleluia or Amen or, um, and we would eventually read our way through this encyclopedia and end up at Z, like Zion or something like that. I really, that's what was in my head. And I really wasn't sure, you know, okay, I, I, I'm going to read this Catholic encyclopedia and Lord, if you're calling me to do this, then that's what I'm going to do. Well, it started right off the bat because that first night Jeff Cavins was giving the presentation and he says, well, we're, we're going to just read the first paragraph tonight. 
And so I want to read it to you. Because it surprised me so much. And it set my entire attitude for the Catechetical Institute and for studying the Catechism. So here I'm expecting to start at the beginning of the alphabet in the Catholic Encyclopedia and we get paragraph one. God, infinitely perfect and blessed in himself, in a plan of sheer goodness, freely created man to make him share in his own blessed life. For this reason, and at every time and at every place, God draws close to man. He calls man to seek him, to know him, to love him with all his strength. He calls together all men, scattered and divided by sin, into the unity of his family, the church. To accomplish this, when the fullness of time had come, God sent his Son as Redeemer and Savior. In his Son and through him, he invites men to become in the Holy Spirit his adopted children and thus heirs to his blessed life. Wow! Talking about God's plan of sheer goodness is not what I expected to be the first paragraph in the Catholic Encyclopedia. And it really lays out that this document is something we engage in and we draw truth from, but it's that it, that truth that impacts our lives because God wants us to participate in his plan of sheer goodness because God is goodness himself. What we've just read in here is another version of the kerygma. God created you. We sinned. Jesus came. God, through his Holy Spirit, gives us the choice to become children of God. Through his Holy Spirit, transformed made holy, drawn close to him because he is close to us. As it says right here, it calls together, he calls men to seek him, to know him, to love him with all their strength because, because at every time and every place, God draws close to man. What a beautiful way to start I have the entire paragraph highlighted, and I don't know how many times I've come back just to read this first paragraph, just to remind myself that all the truth that we're going to read in this book revealed to us from God, all of it falls in because God has a plan of sheer goodness, and He wants you and He wants me to participate in it. What a beautiful way to start studying the truths of our faith, to always remember that those truths are part of God's plan of sheer goodness for you and for me. I want to live in God's plan of sheer goodness. I want to be a son of my Heavenly Father who loves me so much to become one like me, to humble himself in his Son to come and die on the cross for me, that he may draw me back to himself. So that begins our journey. Our journey into the Catechism, into to study the truths of our faith, and to let the Lord transform our hearts in the process. To learn more about what it really means to live in a plan of sheer goodness, to be transformed by Him who loves us. That's what we're going to do as we walk through this. Because as I started, that the truths of our faith should be something that we just live that they permeate who we are, they make us who we are, because God has created us that way, and he's called us to live as his daughters and sons. So each week, 
I'm going to take another section as we move through here. I'll tell you at the end what sections we went through, so don't feel like you have to do any reading beforehand. Just turn on the video and watch. If something touches your heart, grab your catechism and read into it. If you struggle with it, pray with it. The catechism is something we can pray with. Again, it's not the Catholic Encyclopedia. It's so much more. And it's filled with references, references of scripture, references from church fathers and saints that help us again understand God's plan of sure goodness. So we look forward to next week where we'll begin our journey in the Catechism beyond paragraph one. But paragraph one will live with us because it's God's plan of sheer goodness that he calls us into and that our hearts desire to be in with him who created us. May God bless your week. And we'll ask John Paul II and St. Rocco, who happens to be the patron saint of dogs and dog owners, to pray for us.